So knowing how receive sensitivity works, how SNR works, and how RSSI works, we'll take a look at data rates. The stronger the signal, or the better the SNR, the bigger the MCS, or the modulation, modulation to coding, coding scheme, the better the data rate. But we said the RF environment is always changing and very dynamic. So when we move around, it changes a lot. And with that, the RSSI and SNR are changing a lot. So what your device does, depending on what's happening with the communication, whether it's able to, whether it's still able to decode the message from the other side, it will dynamically switch the data rates. This is called dynamic rate switching. So with the way the environment changes, with the way the RF environment changes, client devices will consistently change uh, the data rate, which will obviously uh, immediately affect the application performance and the user experience of the client or the user. So why is this important? Well, one of the things we're trying to determine with Extreme Cloud IQ is the client experience or user experience, uh, which is oftentimes very elusive. And the first thing we take a look at is, so one of the things you see is, is a, a view called Client360. In the view Client360, you will see the negotiated data rate or the maximum data rate that can be used between the two devices, AP and the client, and the actual data rate. And the actual data rate is usually going to be lower because it's going to be switched from that negotiated data rate to something that's actually usable depending on SNR, uh, things like CRC errors. Uh, and it, that difference between negotiated data rate and the actual data rate can be a difference between a poor performing network or a well performing network. And that's what you've got to look at. So when you have your network up and running, Extreme Cloud IQ will tell you not only what the network was designed to do and how it should operate in theory, but actually how it's operating on a client per session basis. And you'll be able to look at, oh, these are the actual data rates that the client device is using. These are the actual data rates of the communication. And you'll be able to flag, oh, this is not right, or this is below what I want, or this is below the threshold of my application. I need to do something about it. And this is the power of being able to collect all this data collated and post-processing in, in the cloud. And it, we can do that for every single client, compare it across the whole floor, the whole deployment, zone, building, campus, you name it. And this helps you as a Wi-Fi specialist or a, or a network architect or somebody that's responsible for running and designing these networks in making better decisions, in making sure your network is operating optimally. The coverage of a single AP obviously doesn't go on forever. In fact, electromagnetic signals don't travel on forever. They will fade out. Uh, and the phenomenon of them fading out is called free space Pavlov or FSPL. So before a client device leaves the coverage area of an AP completely, or before that SNR falls below the threshold that we still consider healthy, it needs to switch to another AP. And the process, that handover process, is called roaming. And in terms of coverage, we're now talking about two different coverages, primary and secondary. Primary coverage is the coverage of the AP that the client is currently associated to, whereas the secondary coverage is the coverage of the next best candidate AP for roaming. Uh, in this case, we're talking about, so if we're talking about coverage-based design, we're saying primary coverage of the AP, which we can also see call a cell boundary, is at least 70 dBm or better, whereas the secondary coverage starts at negative 75 dBm. And you need to have this amount of overlap between two access points to implement successful roaming. Now, this is a very simple scenario. As, you, as we move from coverage-based to more capacity-based designs, obviously these cells will shrink which means you need to have more APs, you need to be more careful with the design, and eventually also try to leverage dual 5 gigahertz APs to make sure uh, these things work out as you need. The roaming information is also something we collect in Extreme Cloud IQ, and we do expose visibility into roaming events. For each client, you'll be able to see how long it took for it to roam, 
and if that roaming was successful. An unsuccessful roam would mean client had to re-authenticate. A successful roam would mean re-authentication was not required and the communication with the distribution system and the client continues uninterrupted, which means your applications are still up and running and you're not experiencing any disruptions of your service. One thing to remember, roaming decisions are always done on the client side. So the client device is the one that decides when to initiate roaming. And most often, that roaming algorithm will depend on SNR or RSSI. And that's why we need to have primary and secondary coverages within specific parameters. When we talk about um, primary and secondary coverage, the coverage overlap between the two is really just you know, duplicate primary and secondary coverage from the perspective of a Wi-Fi device. So how does the Wi-Fi device see those two uh, access points? The primary one and the secondary one, the secondary one being the next roaming candidate. Each Wi-Fi station needs to hear at least one more access point in addition to the one it's currently connected to. And that access point, for example, uh, in the example shown on the slide, is at least within 70 dBm or better. Because when you move closer, that coverage will improve and uh, it, it, will, it will only get better after you roam. So how do you know something goes wrong, either with your design or with a specific client device? What's the indicator of, of bad Wi-Fi or bad performing Wi-Fi, poor performing Wi-Fi? Uh, the number one indicator that something's going wrong is layer two retransmissions. And layer two retransmissions happen either when a frame is transmitted from one station to the other and the returning acknowledgement is lost, or a station transmits a frame which is actually never received on the other end. And there's a couple of reasons why that might happen. One is actual inter interference. So when an interference happens, another device transmits on that same channel with Wi-Fi being a half-duplex medium, that transmission may be interrupted, corrupted, and the receiving device cannot decode it. Or the returning acknowledgement frame is disrupted in the same way by another device transmitting within that same frequency space and interfering with the transmission. That's called an RF interference. The other three reasons why you might have a layer to retransmission have to do less with actual interference but more with bad design. So a layer to retransmission can be a result of an interferer, but it can also be an indicator that the design is actually not that good. The, the reason why you might have them is because you have low SNR. Low SNR or low signal to noise ratio means it's very difficult for the client device to hear or for station to hear the other station and to decode that signal. Sometimes it fails, sometimes it succeeds, and when it fails, it needs to retransmit the frame. Low SNR is a result of bad Wi-Fi design because maybe the noise floor wasn't taken into account, maybe the power settings are wrong, maybe the RRM algorithm went haywire, um, and it, or the lowest performing device wasn't used as a reference when designing that network. Maybe some devices simply cannot perform well on the network while others can. The other source could be adjacent cell interference. Adjacent cell or adjacent channel is a channel that is uh, overlapping with the channel that we're currently using, which is something you should normally not do. However, in some cases, the adjacent channels are used by our uh, neighbors, for example, a company in a shared office space is deploying their own Wi-Fi and their channel selection is interfering with our channel selection. In that case, we probably should not be using some of those channels. And usually the best answer is move to 5 GHz. And finally, you could have a hidden node scenario. A hidden node scenario, in short, is when you have three stations, two of which cannot see each other through the RF space or uh, through Wi-Fi communication. And if they cannot hear each other or see each other, they cannot coordinate medium access. And if they cannot coordinate medium access, you can, ha you can run into a scenario when they both transmit at the same time. 
And when that transmission finally collides, it causes interference, corruption of the frame, it drop, you drop the frame or you don't never receive the frame, and it causes retransmission further on. So hidden nodes are normally very difficult to identify as hidden nodes, but what you will see is layer two retransmissions. And the cost for hidden nodes, well, bad design. You've deployed access points in a way where maybe two of them cannot hear each other. Um, for example, the most straightforward scenario would be you have a beam running on top of your ceiling. You have one AP on one side of that beam, the other AP on the other side of that beam. They can both see the client device, but they cannot hear each other. That would be a very straightforward hidden node scenario. Most of them are actually much, much more complex, and they can arise in for time. So you deploy your Wi-Fi, you design your Wi-Fi, there's no hidden node, and through time, when the physical environment changes, when you rearrange your walls, when you rearrange the way the physical space looks like, uh, those hidden nodes may occur, and you need, maybe you need to revisit your design. And you can look at layer two retransmissions to see uh, whether everything is okay or not, and whether, when you explore the way the layer two retransmissions occur, whether that's a hidden node or something else. So when we move to a capacity-based design, the question is, how many clients per AP should I use? Or how many clients can an AP support in this design? And unfortunately, the answer is, it depends. It depends on the types of application you're using, on the types of APs you'll be using, and the types of clients you're gonna be using. They all form an ecosystem, and this ecosystem is your wireless LAN network. So it's not just the access points, it's not just the clients, it's both of them working together. And also, the applications that they're using will determine what's your capacity plan. So, when you are designing for capacity, first thing you need to look at is types of applications. Are we just using browsing services? Are we using any real-time applications? High definition video? Or something that requires both real-time communication and high, and high payloads? How many clients are we going to support normally, you know, how our environment is going to grow. So when you design your network, you don't just design it for tomorrow, you design it for a year, two years from now. So how much is your client population going to grow in those two years? And most importantly, what type of clients are you supporting? And this is, some of these answers can be obtained through Extreme Cloud IQ. Extreme Cloud IQ will tell you a lot about your client population which is something that is, especially for large networks, not that straightforward to, uh, it's, it's not an information that's very straightforward to obtain because of things like BYOD, things like guest devices, things like unauthorized devices, devices that you don't know are on your network, and Extreme Cloud IQ will get you the visibility into not only how many devices are on the network and what they are, but also what kind of radio capabilities they have, which will help you answer some of the questions around your Wi-Fi design.